Uh, members, you're all very welcome to the resumption of the March monthly meeting. I just call on Mr. Kilfeather to um, read the COVID procedures. Um, can I hear, like, members, the national standard operating guidance for attendance at council meetings provide that all in attendance be informed at the start of the meeting of the COVID-19 control measures in place. I'd like to draw your attention to a few issues. Each person attending this meeting in person should have completed a COVID declaration form before entering the room. These forms will also serve as a record of attendance for contract contact tracing purposes if required. The meeting room has been prepared in accordance with the standard operating guidance. Face coverings must be worn by all attendees when entering and leaving the room. There should be no congregating in the building before or after the meeting. A one-way system is in place for entering and exiting the room and exit will be via the side door. In compliance with the recommendations in the standard operating guidance, the meeting time will not exceed one hour 55 minutes. Attendees must adhere at all times to the two metre physical distancing and following the public health advice in relation to hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette. A response plan is in place in the event that an attendee at the meeting feels unwell or is displaying possible COVID-19 symptoms. An isolation room has been provided. If anyone feels unwell during the meeting, you should alert myself or Kevin and you will be escorted to the isolation room. Thank you, Gerald. Thanks, Mr. Confeather. Um, now, members, just if anyone is speaking, if you could turn on your microphones and when you're not, turn them off. It's just so the members that are zooming in can hear everybody. Councillor Hayley. No, just as International Women's Day, I just want to congratulate all the women that we have as elected members and also women in jobs as we're here in Sligo County Council. Thanks, Councillor Hayley. We'll, we'll agree with that. We'll all second and concur with that. Uh, Okay, um, so we start off where we resume the last day, uh, motion number 34, Councillor Joe Quainan. Yeah, Kyra, thank you for the report. I'll second. Okay, thank you. I got the report and we had a long discussion on, on housing uh, at our last meeting, so I don't want to go back on it again. Uh, but I do, just to say that in West Ligo, we have also a serious housing crisis and it's looking very, very serious for the months and years ahead simply because there has been no housing development constructed over the last 15 years. Uh, the council have granted their, their building eight houses in, in Dromore, but the rest of the area, uh, they don't even have land to purchase houses, and it's extremely worrying. And there are many, many people waiting on, uh, to rent or to buy and can it. Uh, so I got my report, uh, and I just want to ask uh, Mr. Murphy, who's in today instead of uh, for John Moore and asking two questions regards uh, the turnkey. Turn, I've done that for turnkey as just one option of many. That we, it, to, to, to solve this problem, I believe it'll take uh, the, both the private and um, and government working together to build houses on the different uh, areas to solve the problem in the county. But on the turnkey one, first of all, I have two questions for Mr. Murphy. One, his his uh, his um, reply this refers to um the sligo and environs area and that doesn't cover west ligo and the second question i want to ask him fairly bluntly do what is the uh now the department's view on constructing local authority houses in county sligo is there a new emphasis or is it the same old same old or where are we regards the department's uh, commitment to Sligo at this stage. Uh, members, um, in relation to your question there, we do intend advertising for turnkey developments in some of our major settlements outside Sligo City. And we'll advertise that between now and the end of the month, and we will be including Ennis Groen in that listing. Um, your second question there, it's certainly my understanding that the emphasis from the new government is going to see uh, an emphasis on direct build rather than anything else or in conjunction with anything else. So I think we will see a, a mixture of uh, build types with the emphasis in particular being on local authority build. Okay. Right, we'll wait on, we, we, we'll, 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 we, we acknowledge COVID and all that has held all, has held development up, but we, we, we will wait to see how this minister performs over the next six months. 
But I'd be heartened to hear that there's an em emphasis on building local authority houses because I, we need them and we need them right around our county. Thanks, Councillor Queen and Mr. Kilfeather. Um, Cahir, look, this just might be timely to advise the council that Minister Darrow Breen may be coming to Sligo on Friday next. Um, he's indicated to us that it is possible, um, and he has indicated a proposed agenda for a meeting um, which would cover uh, new housing delivery and future targets, affordable housing and cost rental and homelessness. But it's we, you know we haven't got confirmed details yet. We'll keep the members advised as to the arrangements and if the, if the meeting is ha is happening. So it's tentatively fixed for this Friday. Thank you, Kerry. Put on your mic. Is it will it take place? Much? Will he be invited? Is elected member he's going to talk to? Why well, is it public? We're we're, await, we're we're awaiting to see what 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 actually the details are. We we just got notice at half five on Friday evening. It, it's been made clear that it's just a possibility at the moment. I think we would have to have regard for um, for COVID guidelines in relation to when a meeting would take place. But we will be engaging with the Coherlock. Um, in relation to whatever arrangements th there are going to be. Okay, um, members, we'll move on so to motion number 35, Councillor Queen, and again. Yeah, again, I thank uh, Star for our report. Mm. Uh, I guess for, uh, Your mic, Joe, sorry. I ask her, um, regards if this project can be develop developed. Uh, it will be a, a really exciting project for North Mayo and West Sligo. What it means is a greenway all the way from Kalala along the coast to Innisfroan. Now, I acknowledge this. It's a very sensitive area and there, there are many challenges. Um, un until the, the reports are done, we won't know whether it's on or not. Can I ask, uh, Ms. Clark, um, where are we with the two counties on this now on the funding and to get, that, to get the feasibility study commenced? Okay, thanks, Cahirlock. Um, yes, uh, Councillor Queen, and you're right. It's it's um it's an ambitious project, and it's not without its challenges. But it is about linking up uh, Kilala uh, to Ballina and Ballina to in the scroll, um, along the Moy Estuary, and uh, it is part of the recent plan that was launched on the Moy Estuary. So there's about 12 kilometres of a recreational route. Um, I suppose from Ballina to Sligo, in uh, most of which is in County Sligo. At this point in time, it's it's only at the um, stage where we are applying for leader cooperation funding, uh, which is additional funding on top of the normal leader program we'd be familiar with. So Sligo has done its bit in terms of it getting through the the local action group, the the LCDC, the local action group, and we're waiting on Mayo to do the same with their um, local action group. So once that's done, it's then forwarded to the department for uh, joint funding as a joint project uh, to be funded under the, cooper the cooperation, the leader cooperation funding that is available. So um, I suppose in terms of time scale, it possibly will be, by the time all of that work is done and the application lodged, you're probably talking about another month or two. So therefore, there will be a procurement and a tendering process. And um, I would imagine that it probably take the best part of 2021 before any feasibility study is finalized or definitely the, the last quarter. But you're not to hold me to that. That's only my own interpretation of, um, of how um, you know these projects and the development uh, phase uh, pans out. Uh, there are, of course, issues because of SAC and off-road issues as well so it's not something that isn't without constraints and challenges but we certainly do see it as having huge potential for in a scroll and uh, particularly extending i suppose maybe what would be a um, tourism product offering um out of in a scroll and linking it to balana uh, and uh, we certainly uh, from a lag perspective they have given it its its full support and we'll certainly be pushing forward with it with Mayo County Council as soon as they get it over the line with their with their lag. Okay, members, that okay? You all agreed with that. Um, my councillor Clark. 
Uh, I want to be associated with the motion and support of Kerala. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Clark. Um, that's agreed. So, members will move on. So, to uh, motion 36. We all know the challenges facing climate change, and um, and there are many. And um, but when the solution is going to create more problems uh, than what is uh, was now before us, then I think we we you know we have to take stock. First of all, as we board board pneumonia or season production of peat production. Mm -hmm. And, and there will be no more peat croquettes after 2024. In fact, poor pneumonia have slowed down the process, and it's now virtually impossible to get peat croquettes. And at this moment in time, the coal companies are importing thousands of tonnes of peat croquettes from Scotland and from other parts of Europe. And there's our carbon footprint. Uh, worry, more worrying instead is our horticulture industry which depends on mass peat as a, as a, to grow the mushrooms in particular and our vegetables. And it now looks that would be also important that from Scotland, from Germany and from other parts of Eastern Europe. And these are jobs in rural areas in our counties. Uh, and they're going to be, they will not be, it won't be competitive if they're importing the products. So I'm calling on the minister to review uh, what is now happening. And regards cutting of turf, it, 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 at the moment it hasn't been touched, but it's only a matter of time until they'll challenge the only people who have no other alternative fuel but turf. So I'm saying that rural Ireland, another bloat another, another, another rural Ireland, our voices are weak and our space is small in Dáil Éireann because they don't have the votes anymore. It's all cities, no disrespect. But we, we closed down our beet industry, and now we import all our sugar, and we're now about to do the same with horticulture, which is absolutely crazy, madness. But of course, Minister Ryan cycling around Dublin on a bicycle, he wouldn't even have a remote idea or understanding about these problems. So I put the motion to the floor, Councillor Hume, I want to talk Thanks, Councillor Clark. Seconded by Councillor Haley. Yeah, I want to support the motion and also um, I suppose one thing that we need to do as well at present, there's a public consultation on on uh, so on on fuel uh, that the minister is running out at the moment, and I think that it's important that us we we make representation on that as well and get it out there to the general public that uh, on solid fuel that there is a public consultation on it and people should be made aware of it. Uh, in relation to turf, I cut turf myself. I've cut turf all my adult life. I saved turf for myself and my parents and at a, at a very small cost. Uh, we don't, I don't buy oil, I don't buy gas, and I don't buy coal. So, as I says, we're, I'm playing my part in the environment, as well as a lot of other people that's out there in rural Ireland. And the problem is that a lot of the houses that we have at present that old people are living in, they're not suitable as well for putting in on the floor heating uh, and other alternatives. Uh, the trans uh, the, there is a commission that uh, has acknowledged the need for families to have their own plots and be allowed to continue to practice with cotton turf. But my concern is that's grand if you have your own plot. But like me, I don't have my own plot but I cut turf every year. So the minister needs to come out and be straight and tell exactly what we're entitled and what we're not. Because until we get an alternative, that's the only way we have. All I do is cut turf and sticks, and that's my fuel. And what it cost me roughly for a year, I can, about 400 euro. That's what it cost me to run my fuel for my house. You won't get any cheaper than that. And I might even get two years out of that if it's a good year for cutting turf. And another thing as well, as regards the milling of peat, it's again a strange arrangement that we have natural resources which we are prohibited from using, while we are importing mill, mill peat from fellow EU countries, which are supposed to be under the same regulations as ourselves. So, does mean what are what are we doing here? Is are we just ticking boxes for the sake of ticking boxes? Are we really having a look at the important things? There's no better people to look after the environment than the farmers and the people themselves. As I says, any person I see up cutting turf, they're there for one reason and one reason only, to heat for their homes. Thank you.
Thanks, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Tom Fox. Yeah, just to, just to uh, support the motion, I agree with what has been already said. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Michael Clark. Yeah, also just to, to support the motion, Caherlock uh, and and Councillor Queen and Councillor Healy as well covered. And just to say that as we speak, there's a load of Polish briquettes landing in Dublin Port, and uh, that supports uh, Councillor Queen's view that the. Uh, the, the the footprint isn't isn't being matched, and it's not. There's no joint up thinking here. And uh, thanks, Kieran. Thank you, Councillor Milani. Just to support the motion. Thanks, uh, Councillor Donald Roy. Uh, again, to support the motion, and uh, I think especially for the horticulture, it is going to be continued to be needed for as long as there's horticulture done in this country, there's going to be a need for it for that. Um, I think for home heating, they should be encouraged to use the carrot rather than the stick. And, um, you know, not all houses are suitable for retrofitting at the moment, but as time goes by, every house comes to a stage where it needs retrofitting. And at that stage, it should be done to a stage that, that it won't be, it just won't be viable. People will choose not to, and the people will choose when it doesn't, when it's not financially in their interest to do it. So, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Paul Taylor. And thanks, Cahir. Look, just to support the motion as well, I think everybody has it fairly well covered, but look, we, we all have to be, you know, concerned with, with climate change, but for certainly, and it's been said already, look, for existing houses, there there is no alternative um, available at the moment. So, um, just like to support the motion. Okay. Yes, Councillor Gibbons. I just ask a question in relation to it, now. don't take me wrong on this. I think the idea of the preservation of the bogs in Ireland, that doesn't mean I'm not supporting the motion, I do support the motion because there's two, two sides to this. The preservation of the bogs in Ireland, one in it was because it helps to clear the atmosphere, clean the atmosphere, that's one aspect that allows the oxygen, things like that. The amount of wildlife and whatever else that depends on that, brushing, whatever is in the bogs, and the bogs are very natural. I would look at the whole thing of them bringing in the uh, peat from the likes of Scotland and everything else. Well, that's their loss of bogs that's there that we're taking in. Now I know it has the other side of it that we're burning the peat in the likes of uh, briquettes and everything else and the amount of jobs that's gone and whatever else and I just think myself and I do know because talking to people, I'm not from an agricultural background I never, I, I, we never burnt turf that's the reality, but people that has no, but people that has burnt turf, reality to it and it has been said before, when a person went out and cut a bank of turf, that's exactly what it was known as, a bank of turf. They moved to a different bank the following year, they moved to a different bank, and it allowed the bank to regenerate and repair itself. Now, what we had in this country there at one stage, we bored in Amona, I mean to say that strip, uh, stripped the land bloody were clean, they wasn't able to regenerate. And that was that aspect to it. So it's kind of just something that I am looking at. I will support the motion. But I'm looking at the conservation end of it as well, the conservation of our bogs. And I think myself that it's a, plays a big part in the ecosystem and especially of this country. So, as I says, I will support the motion, but I kind of have, you know, kind of 50-50 doubts in relation to what I stay with it. Thanks. Thank no. <laughs> It's just as well the mics are off here, members. Now we move on. <laughs> now, members, we're moving um, moving on. Um, unfortunately, Councillor Castley hasn't logged in yet, so motion 38, Gerard Milani, and I'll second it. We'll come back to Councillor Castley. Um, I've got the report here on it, and I'm reasonably happy. I'm hoping that sooner rather than later that that charge and point will be put in the care park in body mm. Yeah, thanks Councillor Manny and just in supporting you on that I know this is something that um, was was raised with the environment section when the, the plan for the care park was initiated and uh, I think from the discussions with them that uh, putting in of the the e charging point is one thing, but it's the maintenance and the running and it's getting maybe ESP or whoever to come on board and I believe that some of these e charging points, if you put them in, you need to get the the quicker charge one, which seems to be the more popular, but it's the more expensive one to run. But I suppose it's the way we're going now that areas will look for them. You know, so um, I'd support that motion as well. Is that agreed? 
I think this might be an opportunity now for us right to aim in Ryan and say, look at what we're trying to do in the rural area and see what support or help he'll give us towards it. Because yeah. as, as you could have set an example here in, in that care park. Mm. And as you says, if he's mm. really serious about looking after rural learning, it wasn't too long ago that he was seeing one care to do 30 of us. So I say one one charging point will do 30 cares too. Yeah. yeah. Okay, members, that's great. Um, motion 39, Councillor Mullaney. Yeah, no. Councillor Taylor. I spoke to Bernard Scott on that, on this, and I want to defer the motion. He's dealing with the landowners there, so I that, leave it for him. That's okay, okay agreed, Councillor Mullaney. Uh, motion number 40, Councillor Bray. Second row, Councillor Boyle. Well, here, look, I have to say that I'm disappointed with the response from, from Mr. Murphy. The Department of Housing and Local Government has publicly stated that the compulsory purchase orders can deliver social housing more speedily and at a much lower cost than new bills. Now, we know that other councils in the country are successfully using compulsory purchase orders to buy houses so as to reduce the number of people on housing waiting lists. And yet, on each occasion, I have raised the issue at our council meetings over the past couple of years, we are provided with a list of reasons as to why we shouldn't use CPOs to purchase houses. I certainly realise and, and acknowledge that in order to solve the housing crisis, there is a need for a major uh, public house building programme funded by the state and, and controlled by the local authorities. However, in addition to a house building programme, I believe action must also be taken in regard to the large number of dwellings which are lying vacant in the midst of a housing crisis. Uh, I highlighted this issue on numerous occasions, however, to date, no action has been taken to use compulsory purchase powers to acquire long-term vacant dwellings in Sligo. Uh, the market value Cahirlach has to be paid to the owners of property being sought by way of CPO, so we're not talking about seasoned dwellings. These houses are vacant, not for sale, and in many cases they're detracting from the neighbourhood. And indeed, only a few weeks ago, councillors were highlighting the need to address derelict houses in Connolly Park and in Tubbercurry. And in this context, the use of compulsory purchase powers may actually encourage owners of long-term vacant properties to either put them up for sale or put them back in use. Uh, the most recent census figure states that there are over 4,000 vacant houses in County Sligo, excluding holiday homes. And clearly, uh, this is wrong and unacceptable at a time when we have a housing crisis. And I know that uh, not all of those dwellings would be suitable for social housing or may not be located in areas where there's a high demand. However, I believe that many of them would be suitable for social housing and I, I feel the council should be using its compulsory purchase hours, uh, powers to, to acquire them. I formally move the motion. Thanks, Councillor Bree. Councillor Gino Boyd. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd have to 100% agree with Councillor Bree. Everywhere you look, there's vacant houses, and every time we're on the phone, it's people looking to get on the housing list, or they're dealing with what happened, they can't get a place to rent. The high rents, you have RAS, people that can't change over from RAS to HAP, they're going to be stuck on long rents all their life. And it's absolutely disgraceful when you see the amount of houses available. When you go for a walk down the street into any of the um, estates, it doesn't matter where you go, there's vacant houses, and there's nobody in them. So I think it's time that we do, do use compulsory purchase orders on these homes to try and get the housing list down. And while I do agree that there does need to be a serious build of social housing and affordable, it's about time now that we start pushing people who own these houses and leaving them laying up into either being fined or uh, using compulsory purchase order. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Clark. Uh, to hear, look, I want to uh, commend Declan Bree for bringing this motion, and I strongly agree with his... Uh, with his uh, statement on it, and it has it has a dual purpose. It has the purpose of tidying up our estates that are where there's vacant houses, and it is providing housing for for people that's badly need of it. And I, I think it, it would be time now that our housing department would make some staff available to begin the process. I know it's a long, cumbersome process taking uh, possession of, of of properties in this way by CPOs. But it, it, it's time, it has to be looked at now because as, as De De Declan Bree has said, we have an issue in Tubbercurry and other places that we need to address. Thank you, Kira. Thank you, Councillor Queenan. Yeah. I want to agree with, uh, with, with all the previous speakers. I spoke a few minutes ago about Inniscone. There are at least 10 houses in Inniscone thrown, well, I would say thrown there for the last five or six years. Nobody knows who owns them. It's crazy, absolutely crazy. Those people put out them houses, they are into the People that owned them originally, the banks took them and they left them there and they're abandoned. They're eyesore and all the people in my area and other areas that are looking for houses. So uh, I do agree with Councillor Clark. I think we'll have to start the process uh, and get support when the minister comes the weekend. 
I, as you, uh, Councillor Bria saying 4,000 houses, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they, uh, that's, that's true. Uh, should that solve our housing problem if all the houses were taken in charge? Uh, Councillor Gilroy. Uh, thank you. Uh, again, a, a great motion and, and good to have it in there and to be asked the question. Um, I suppose from a personal point of view, I, I can comment on the BER side of it that it's it's going to be very hard to find houses with low BER ratings that are that have good BER ratings that are going to be at the price that the council is is willing to pay because um, that's going to be pushing the price of them up. It is becoming a bigger factor in it all the time. Um, I know exactly what Councillor Queenan is referring to there on the the repossessed houses and things like that. The banks, if if the council CPOs them from the banks, there's going to be a problem where the the banks. Uh, or the, the person who had the debt originally could say the optimal price was not achieved for it. They insist that they're sold by auction. Um, I've known lots of cases where I've gone in to do surveys on houses and the people have said, is there any way we can buy the house ourselves? And I'm sure maybe Councillor Fox has similar uh, testimony to give. But what happens is if it's not sold by public auction, they can turn around and say to the financial institution, that would have cleared our debt. You can't chase us for the rest. So that's why the banks won't want to do that. It's the way the law is, is structured at the moment, unfortunately. And they, ha they have to try and get the maximum price they can. And if they if they say, well, the council CPO'd us, so therefore we're out whatever loan was outstanding against the house, and we need to get the full price of that. And I think it could get very, very messy on those particular ones. That doesn't mean there aren't other houses that are lying idle that could be bought, but just the ones that Joe was referring to there. Um, it, it could be very, very difficult in that situation because I know people who, who were renting them, who were tenants and wanted to buy them out, including in Ennis Grown. And, and I was in them, I was doing service for them. And uh, they do, they, they're not allowed, the banks are not allowed to sell it except by public auction. Uh, to recover the debt, so it's it's a grey area, so it, it's it's dangerous on that particular one. But there's lots of other houses that are lying empty that have been abandoned. Thank you. Thank you. That's agreed. So, all members, um, I'll refer back to uh, Councillor Casserly. I believe she's been able to get through on on the Zoom motion thirty seven. Councillor Casserly, can I, I get second us? that? Second of Councillor Gilroy. Councillor Casserly, you're on mute. Thank you. Uh, apologies for being late. Um, yeah, thank you for the report. I just have a couple of questions, but I can email them also. Um, the questions are, when does the council expect discussions with the NTA regarding the funding and delivery of the active travel programme for, for Sligo to conclude? How long does the council envisage that the review of existing cycling and walking infrastructure will take? Is there a plan for the form for the format the review will take, and will it involve consultation with current and potential user groups? And what criteria will the council use to prioritise the active travel measures to be adopted as part of the transportation plan? Now, I will email those as well because I don't expect you to take them down, and I don't expect to have to get the answers immediately. So, um, I, I'll um, I'll wait for those answers. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ronald Gilroy. Yeah, support the motion and like especially to, to Ross's point in Strand Hill, there are two areas that could easily be um, serviced with uh, with cycle routes and safe cycle routes segregated from the road from the traffic on the road. So uh, support the motion. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sinead Maguire. Thank you. I'd also like to support the motion. I think can you hear me okay? Yeah. Good. Thanks. I think it's a very uh, timely motion given the recent announcement of funding in this regard. Um, and as Councillor uh, Casserly has outlined in her motion, it, it ticks many boxes from um, encouraging uh, more walking and cycling to improving air pollution um, and also uh, climate change um, measures. So I wholeheartedly um, uh, support the motion and would also ask that we all be circulated with the responses to those particular queries that Councillor Cassidy has raised. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Councillor Arthur Gibbons. Go here, like I asked to support a motion and as an avid cycler myself, and I actually 
I enjoy getting out and nothing better even. I have even a thriller on the back of the bike for the grandchildren and everything else. I really make the most of it. But the one thing that I would say in relation to it, Sligo, I think myself, it's it's getting there in the likes of cycle lanes and things like that. You can see it there with the Mist or West British River route. You can see uh, most routes around Sligo, even to the new junction that's going out there on the, the N15 and whatever else it's all, including cycle lanes. And I think it's a way forward. I feel myself... For uh, the physical end of it, the mental end of it, and just the end of us keeping down pollution, the more people that we encourage out there on bicycles and walking, the better. But the one thing, and I would plea in relation to this, and I brought it up as a, a motion there when I first was co-opted onto this county council, and it was actually, I was knocked back on it in a sense. The one plea that I would make in relation to it is the likes of the cycle lanes, if we can keep them debris free. Because so what is happening, even if you go down to Ross's Point and it's the same out Strand Hill and you come to a dip in the road or whatever, all the debris that's actually in on the cycle lanes, the people actually have to cycle, they're pushed out onto the road. And the other aspect that I would say in relation to it, it's because of uh, that aspect of it as well, there's potholes as well coming in a lot of them cycle lanes and especially in those areas this is outside of the town that's not getting a regular clean up or whatever else but I would ask that that's taken into consideration but I do support the motion thanks very much okay thanks members that motion is agreed uh, moving back so to motion number 31 councillor Gibbons I'll second that yeah yeah 41 sorry yeah go here look I was approached by a number of people within the Ballymore area. I know it's well outside of my time, but I will not turn my back on anybody. Anybody that asks me to bring to do something for them, I will do it. The residents, a number of residents within the area of Ballymore actually approached me. They have um, they got um, a petition done there just before the COVID-19 uh, kicked into place. They have over 600 signatures that's on it. Because they maintain, and I actually went out and I visited the site, and I feel myself that it's in a very dangerous location, the exit from the park on the, uh, the 293, the R293. The traffic that comes in there comes in a high speed. As traffic is leaving Ballymore, it's cutting back out, the, out that road, or it's going up the ba other back road, which leads you back onto the M17 again. And the have asked me was to bring it up at a council meeting and I felt the best way to bring it up was bring it up as a motion. Now, in fairness, and I have to say it, this isn't the only issue that I've raised about this area and the people that's come to me in relation to roads. There's a number, even now over this weekend, there was another number of roads that actually came up. But this one, I feel myself, needed to be brought up at a council meeting to highlight the fact of the need before some child or some elderly people is hit, is hit on that road. The thing in relation to the thing in relation to that um, road itself, we are lucky and very lucky that there hasn't been a serious accident on it. It is a park that people are using, and it will should get more use in the summer. It's a tourist attraction. It's where Brother Warfrey, the statues and everything else, nearly every Celtic supporter that ever visits Sligo will go and visit that park. And the one thing that I would say in relation to it, everybody is entitled to safety leaving that park. And I would ask everybody to support the motion to have a pedestrian crossing down outside of it. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, <clears throat> Councillor Gibbons. And in second of the motion, I actually had a, a notice of motion down on this myself in 2017 and had previously discussed this with the, the former engineer that was in Ballymote at the time. And I wholeheartedly agree with everything you've said um, because the, the, the problem there, you know, is that while the park... The playground, the park, is all on the, the as you enter Valley Moat on Regional Road 293 is on the right hand side. Anybody that lives on the Sligo side of it has to cross the road because there's no footpath on the um, left hand side as you come out of the park. So anyone that's living in the estates of Castleburn or the new houses are heading down towards the football pitch or the housing estate at Stone Parks all those people where an awful lot of young families are, they have to cross the regional road. And unfortunately, that is the place where they will cross because as you go out further, the traffic gets faster. And there is an issue with speed coming into the town there. And as Councillor Gibbons has said, there's a bend in the road. And as the traffic comes into Ballymote, um, you know, 
small children and parents with buggies and that cars are coming in very very fast and a huge volumes it's an extremely busy stretch of road so i certainly would um, concur with everything you've said and as i said evan raised it and spoken with the previous engineer i hope that there's some funding stream available that they can put a pedestrian crossing in because while i welcome there is one up at the top of the rock in ballymore outside the the um, the old guard station there and the new car park that has made a huge huge different to people in the town that they can cross the road safely. But this particular junction here at the town park, traffic is at a, a far quicker speed and I think it's an issue needs to be addressed. Councillor Mullaney. Yeah, I just want to support the motion and I think it has been well covered by yourself, Cahirla, and by the proposal of the motion, Councillor Gibbons. But I just want to say that there's people that walks to the, the town park and across the or 293 and they go right round the town via the, the soccer and Gaelic pitch and via the health centre but they have to cross the, the R293 at a very dangerous point and it's part of the circle they do every day and I walk in that area myself on the days I'm at work so um, I just want to support the motion I think it's an excellent motion. Thanks. Uh, maybe I can't say yeah, I'd like to support the motion too and just to make you aware that it, back in 2009 on the, under the Ballymote traffic management plan it was put in for two pedestrian crossings there one uh, not far down from Loftus Hall and the other one down towards uh, going down towards Stormbridge Park there where the housing estates are down there as you says but uh, another issue was there as well is coming down from Camros that's a di very dangerous junction there that that you're, you're coming into Ballymote when you when you come into the entrance of that uh, that going into the park so it is it is an issue that needs to be addressed uh, before somebody is hurt in a, that area thank you thanks members motion agreed um motion number 42 councillor bray uh here look uh, the development of the uh, proposed t2 t12 road which will link the junction of mail coach road connolly street with the junction of burton street pierce road has been delayed for many years due to insufficient funding being provided by successive governments it's an objective of the development plan to have this new road uh, link constructed, which will allow vehicles from Temple Street and Mailcoach Road to directly access the Pierce Road and vice versa. It's also an objective which has been included in the new spatial and economic strategy for the Northwest region. However, in real terms, this project, which is a small project in the general scheme of things, has been delayed for over a decade because the department failed to provide the necessary funding to see the project completed. Admittedly, we have received small amounts of uh, grant aid for the project, uh, similar to a, a drip feed. Uh, the ongoing delay continues to cause difficulties, particularly for residents of the Lower St. Bridget's Place area, because motorists must use Lower St. Bridget's as a, an access road until such time as the new link road is completed. Uh, Cahirlock, I welcome the fact that tender documents for the construction of the road will be ready before the end of the year. However, I believe we need to maintain pressure on the department to ensure that adequate funding will be provided to allow for the, the completion of the project. Formally move the motion. Thanks, Guy Thank you, Councillor O'Boyle. Thanks, uh, Councillor Gibbons. I'd like to support the motion. I know myself because I was on the Borough Council when Councillor Bree first muted this. It must have been back in about 2000, 2004, I think. And realistically, it's still here after all this time. It's great to see that Councillor Bree is, hasn't let it go. I suppose you can see he's like a tarrier. That's it. He gets one grip of it and he, he'll not let go of it. And I have to admire the man for that. And it's great to see that the likes of that motion is still there and it's been still pursued by my colleague there. That can break ties for me. Okay, members, that motion is agreed. Thanks, Councillor Bree. And uh, next motion, Councillor Gino Boy. Thank you, Second Chair. Um, Councillor Bree. Due to the COVID 19 restrictions, traditional courses can't take place in the Gildock. Concern has been expressed among students and teachers that the online versions are effectively costing the same as attending the traditional courses. Initially, the INTO says online courses were a welcome alternative option during the pandemic, but in a statement, the INTO says fees being charged for online courses appear excessive considering the cost of accommodation and in-person supports have been removed. The INTO have consistently called for the reinstatement of a grant for student teachers to attend the Gaelic courses which had been abolished by the government during the recession. While the organisation acknowledges the grant has been reinstated for some student teachers, however in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic the INTO is calling for exceptional funding supports to be urgently made available to all student teachers who are participating in online Gaelic courses. 
So that I would ask the council um, to support the motion to review the online guild act fees. Thank you. Oh, here, like I just, I think Councillor Boyle has adequately outlined the case. I formally second the motion. Thank you, uh, Councillor Marie Casterly. Um, thank you. I'd also like to support the motion. I actually um, received um, a very similar query to that, and I wrote to the minister, and I did get a response back. So I'm going to forward that response to Councillor um, O'Boyle. Thanks, members. That motion is agreed. So. Um, moving on, motion 44, Councillor O'Boyle again. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor This motion in a lot longer than the saga with Gordon Elliott coming up and around the place. But um, I suppose the problem I have with the government constantly giving money to private businesses, and I understand it's a big industry, it creates over two billion between the two of them. Um, but the people we deal with daily, the, the organisations we deal with daily, stop suicide no funding. Animal welfare shelters, no funding. This council is in debt of over 20 million. We can't get that taken off. Five months, the entertainment sector is waiting on 50 million. No money. The sports sector, the woman everybody talks about in boxing is Katie Taylor. No funding in Ireland and she had to leave to go to England to be funded. The disability sector is in debt of nearly 20 million. Sligo County Council got funding of 1.4 million for old age and um, disability grants. Also, 20 houses for the new air to water system is not acceptable. And I suppose there's not much we can do about this, but it's just I want to, to say that it's actually disgraceful that we're constantly giving money to private businesses or others, private schools. And um, so I would ask the council for support in this motion because it's just too much money going to an industry like that. It should be self sustaining if you're making two billion a year. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Boy, Councillor Bray. I second the motion because I have to admit I'm at a loss as to why the, the, the government has provided an increase of 12 million euro uh, this year for, for, the, for the industries. And I, you know, I have a major concern about the greyhound industry. Uh, the RTE investigates documentary which detailed the horrific and unspeakable acts of violence committed against animals as part of this industry shocked people throughout the country. Mm -hmm. And it certainly exposed serious issues around animal welfare in the industry. Uh, this is an industry that receives over six times more state money than the total state funding allocated to animal welfare organisations combined. And rather than increase funding, I think we need to see an end to that kind of cruelty that was on display on the, on the RTE programme. Thank you, Carla. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mike Lerk. Uh, thanks, uh, Look. Uh, I think Councillor Dino Boyle has made some very good points in relation to uh, the issues of animal welfare not receiving sufficient funding and but the point has to be made that many many people in Ireland really love horse racing and dog dog racing as much as Gino Boyle would love a game of soccer there's people out there that would love to go to a, a horse race to see the horses race and it's a huge industry it uh, you know employs an awful lot of people uh, and, you know, there is, while there might be one or two bad eggs in every ba apple bag, you know, everybody isn't the same. And I know that people that deal with animals, uh, on a personal level, I have deal with animals on a, on a daily basis. My first pair of lambs is just after arriving here for the spring year. And so uh, I'll be with the animals and the foxes now for the next uh, six weeks. And I think that I want to, to not be associated with uh, with the motion. I'd like to be uh, uh, descended, descended from it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Milani. Yeah, likewise, I'd like to, to descend from the motion as well, even though I agree with a lot of the points made by Councillor Boyle. I think the organisations you mentioned there really deserve funding. But I think in lots of ways, this industry is a flagship industry brings a lot of people into the country, it generates an awful lot of jobs, an awful lot of revenue, and I think it's probably value for money, the fact that it's supported in the way it is by the government. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Queenan. I'm going to present Councillor Morton. Councillor Manning, uh, we, we do know about... Your microphone, uh, cruelty. Sorry, but that's only very small portion of people involved in both the greyhound and in the horse industry. The horse industry alone, uh, the enjoyment and the, uh, the, the positive impact it has on tourism in the country, 
but also the export of our of, of Irish horses uh, worldwide were renowned. And um, I, can, I, I do acknowledge that other organ agencies have not got funding, but you know, by taking the money away from a, a, a thriving industry, will not solve the problem. So I, I won't. Uh, I dissent from that motion. And I, by the way, I wish Gordon Elliott every success in the future. I think he was badly done by uh, in the in the last week. We don't condone when he, the incident that happened two years ago, but the way he's been treated by the media uh, and his family has been disgraceful. So I wish him well in the future. Sir Taylor. Claire, look, I would also wish to dissent from the motion. I look at Councillor Boyle has made a few great points and everything he talks about, we need funding for all that and everything that he speaks of. But, you know, this this is a, a very well supported industry as well and it's huge for our economy. Um, it's a big industry and it creates huge employment. Um, and I, th I think that the knock on effect that it has on, on our economy is huge. So I wish to dissent from the motion. Thank you, Councillor Gilroy. Yeah, also, uh, you know, I'd hate to, I, I, again, absolutely all those other organisations and all those other services need it. I, some feedback there. Uh, if there's someone has their microphone on, yeah, that's grand. Uh, that there's, um, there's a lot of jobs, obviously, but uh, I don't think any of us would like to see Sligo Racecourse closed down. It, uh, it gives great enjoyment to a lot of people in this county and a lot of work. And I think we'd, uh, we'd like to see it continue. And maybe without government funding, the likes of Sligo Racecourse um, may not be there. I've been to three race meetings, horse racing meetings in my life and one greyhound. So I'm not a fan of either sport in a big way, but uh, I do respect other people's right to be involved. So I'll dissent from the motion. Um, Councillor Gibbons. Go here, like the last five speakers have descended from the motion. Personally, myself, I think there's no different in voting against it. Reality to it. What you know, Boyle, Councillor O'Boyle has actually highlighted there was the discrepancy of how they can come along and put that kind of money. Now, we do know that the likes of horse racing, dog racing makes money, accumulates money. But it's an insult to think that even for the disability grant for this council was only over a million and we were damn lucky to get it. We should have been jumping with joy. It's the same with the disability sector and the other sectors that's out there. I have no problem if matching funding was given to them organisations. I'd have absolutely no problem. But I think it's an insult to think that without question that the money that's thrown at the industry, without matching other organisations with similar how in the name of God can they turn around and throw that kind of money at horse racing and dog racing and look at the disability sector and the most vulnerable in society and penny pinch? Now, realistically, morally, I support that motion 100%. I would have no problem whatsoever uh, with anybody that actually dissented from supporting the motion, if it was a thing that it was anywhere near the funding that the organisations needed. But it's not. That's the reality to it. And unless the likes of these messages are sent out here loud and clear, the government will constantly carry on penny pension, where it's bloody well needed. And that's the most vulnerable in society. Thanks very much, Gairlach. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Thomas Walsh. Yeah, thanks, Gairlach. Um, uh, while I agree also with some of the points uh, Councillor Boyle ha has raised, um, I want to um, remove my name from supporting the motion. Um, I think the knock-on effect um, from the amount of money goes into horse racing across the country um, and the uh, spin-off to other SMEs from that, the amount of people employed on it, uh, I think we should always uh, support uh, that industry and continue to do so into the future uh, and we look forward to a very good Cheltenham in uh, next week. Uh, thank you, Cahirla. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sinead McGuire. Um, thank you, Cahirla. Um, I too would like to dissent um, and while I agree with many of the sentiments that Councillor Boyle has raised, um, the wording particularly of the motion uh, uh, doesn't sit well with me. Um, so I'd like to dissent from the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Marie Casterly. Um, 
Thank you. I'd also like to just say, while I do agree as well with what with a lot of the points that Councillor O'Boyle has made, I, I don't think you're. It's like um, comparing apples and oranges. So um, I would. I, I I don't agree either with the wording the way it is, um, because it's actually a little bit. It's confusing a lot of issues. Um, so I would like to dissent also from the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I also want to dissent from the motion myself. Councillor Gino Boyle, I'll bring you in as a proposer. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, personally, I don't think there's anything wrong with the wording. We should be against this type of funding and not against uh, the racehorse um, closing down up there. I've never been at one personally. That's not what I'm into. I won't be looking at Cheltenham. Um, I might put a bet on the football. It's different. But um, I just think we cannot allow this to continue constantly. Councillor Bree mentions uh, the Greyhound programme last year. Swept under the rug and they're getting increased this year. The organisations that need the money never get it. Now, there's 26,000 people employed by the uh, racing industry. There's 1.6 billion made by the horse racing industry and just over 3 mil 300 million uh, made by the Greyhound industry. That 100 million of funding is definitely not going to minimum paid workers. You know, so we shouldn't be giving public money to an industry that creates nearly 2 billion. And as Councillor Gibbon says, dissenting is the same as being against the motion. You're either for it or you're against it. I would like to thank the councillors who did support me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Councillor Boyle. Uh, we'll move on so to motion number 45. Councillor Arthur Gibbons, seconded. Councillor Thomas Healy. Not every child will want to be a doctor or scientist, or even many of the professions that the general public have only come to know over the past year. Epidemiologists are infectious diseases experts of all different levels of expertise. But for a lot of the boys and girls going through the educational system right now, while there is no lack of aspiration on behalf of their parents and guardians or the children themselves, it is because of the lack of access to the educational support facilities and unfortunately the access to these supports can vary greatly depending on the part of Ireland that you live in. And it is this that will restrict children reaching their full potential, both in education and life. While we recognise the brilliant work that the SNAs and other educational support staff do during this time, when our schools are running normally, we also need to recognise that during much of the past year, the education has taken place uh, in the home. And unfortunately, it has become obvious to me because of representations made by parents. And again, showing up the gaps that have been in our education system in the past, that not all parents and guardians have formal education themselves. Or if they do, it may have been quite a while back that the assistance that they can give their children now during these times uh, of homeschooling may be quite limited. While the teachers involved are trying their best, Zoom classes are not the same as classroom teaching. And my fear is that we could be leaving behind a cohort of students in the year 2020-2021 that will never fully recover from the um, uh, disruption of normal school attendance. And without, recognizing, uh, without recognition of the government of this, tens of thousands of students will not reach their potential. And that would uh, be such a failure of us all not to see this happen. All right, I'm done nothing. We need to fill the gap. And it needs to be done now. Government needs to step in now. Work with the teachers and the parents, identify the children that are struggling and supply the resources. Let's not talk about the aspirations of teaching uh, all the children of Ireland equal, let, equally. Just let's all do it. Thank you. I ask you all to support the motion. Thank you. Councillor Healy. Yeah, I'd like to support the motion. I don't think you, you can never put enough funding into education and you can't put enough funding in as, as well into, into young people and make sure that they get everything they need. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Mike Sislerk. Kahir, look, I'd like to strongly support the motion and it's a very timely motion. And I speak as chairman of the Board of Management of Drummond West National School and I want to pay tribute to the, the teachers at Drummond West and indeed every national school throughout the country 
for the attempts in relation to the homeschooling and in relation to getting the premises re ready for bringing kids back to school. It was an enormous body of work for both board of management and staff to get those schools and to keep the education flowing. And there is no doubt that every school in County Sligo is under stress financially. Uh, and it is a major bone of contention that uh, families have to fundraise continuously to keep their national schools viable and flowing. And uh, again, it's a timely motion. Uh, I think we should contact the minister to urge more supports, especially for primary. Thank you, Kierla. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sinead McGuire. Thank you, Kierla. I too would like to wholeheartedly support the motion. Um, I think um, Councillor Gibbons is particularly timely um, with this motion uh, as parents of two young children who um, have access to uh, the internet and have the support of both parents. I still feel um, that they have lost out on not being in the school environment over the last number of months. Um, there's really no alternative for it. Um, so all children are, are at a loss, but there are those who are um, more disadvantaged. Um, I am also a member of our board of management here in Lansborough and would like to pay tribute to all of the teachers um, who've worked so hard and obviously Councillor Castery is among our cohort here and she's been involved in that provision of services which really hasn't been easy for the teachers. They've had to upskill, change the way they work, learn new skills um, and they've done that uh, across the board. Um, in Ransborough, we're particularly fortunate to have an ASD unit um, and I would uh, have particular concerns for those families um, who had a particularly difficult time during the lockdown. I know that their children were brought back to school as early as possible, um, but any loss in teaching, um, particularly for children with additional needs, um, puts them back. And that's not fair on any child, um, particularly not in this day and age when we really know much more about um, difficulties that children face, the importance of trying to address those difficulties at, at an early age. So I wholeheartedly support this motion. Um, I think as Councillor Healy has said, I don't think you can limit the amount um, of funding that you give towards education and the benefits that you reap um, come back numerous fold to those early interventions. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Tom Fox. Yeah, I'd just like to uh, support the motion. It's a great, it's a great motion indeed. Um, and um, I'd like to pay great credit to all who are involved in the schools throughout the, the county. There's so much uh, work being done behind the scenes and many of us don't realise the hours that are put in by the teachers in those uh, schools. Um, Look, as a parent, uh, we have our own son. It's a very difficult time on, on, our, on our youth, and oftentimes they're not able to express the difficulties that they are having. So it's very important that we focus on this, and uh, I just um, wholeheartedly do uh, support this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Marie Casterly. Um Thank you. I'd also like to support the motion and it's it's um, particularly timely on today, International Women's Day. Um, I'd also like to pay tribute to um, I suppose the majority of those in teaching who are who are female, to the SNAs, to teachers, to deputy principals, principals, auxiliary staff, and everybody who works to keep to keep schools going. And I'd like to pay particular attention uh, give particular praise to uh, school principals, both primary and uh, secondary, who have had to, I suppose, keep the whole show on the road. Um, and as was stated, an awful lot is happening behind the scenes since last March. And I've seen firsthand the coordination from getting the PPE equipment and sterilizers and segregating of, 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 of uh, classrooms and, and access all the way through and the uncertainty, having to undeal with uncertainty uh, uh, with the students, with parents and with teachers as well. Um, they've had to deal with that. They've had to prepare all through the summer. Um, I have colleagues 
uh, who are principals who didn't get a break at all during the summer dealing with exam classes then back in September get, keeping everything going from September until Christmas and, and then with the shut with the um, as well the lockdown again having to get timetables sorted students sorted ha, ha, um, making sure that students were able to access lessons online supporting families supporting students supporting teachers supposed supporting teachers who are sick um, who are out on, on long-term sick leave and, and helping those, um, I suppose, to work remotely as well. So I think it's, they're, they're very much the unsung heroes as well of this pandemic. And um, it's, it's important that all schools get supported because when the students get supported, it means that staff also get supported and it makes life easier for everyone. And principals in turn can give more attention to the students. So, um, and it's, it's particularly timely on International Women's Day. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paul Taylor. Yeah, look, can I, I, I just want to um, support the motion as well. Um, it is a timely motion, and as we said and has been said, education is is so so important. Um, and as we've we've already heard from my colleagues, um, their their praise and and definitely deserve praise for for teachers and everyone in, in the education sector. But I, I I'd like to to pay tribute to the parents as well who have carried out all the homeschooling. Um, some working as well uh, and homeschooling their, their children at a very, very difficult time and any family members who have been carrying out the homeschooling as well. I think um, every, I think it has touched most most houses in, 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 in the country at this stage and it's a difficult job um, trying to hold down your own job and do your own job as well as, as homeschooling. So I'd like to uh, pay tribute and, and praise um, the parents who have been doing this work and um, while we praise the the teachers as well and i'd also like to compliment um our our, our young adults and teenagers um uh, for the time that you, you know that that has gone and the difficulty that they have had been away from friends and um, and been away from normal life and in the way that 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 they have conducted themselves um, in their in their homeschooling as well, and 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 and, and all the things that they, they have been doing throughout this pandemic, but just support the motion as well. Thanks, uh, members. I think we all all would support the motion and concur with what you said. Has been the proposer of the motion, and I would like to recognise the work that the teachers have done. It was actually clearly stated in the in the bit of a speech on the SNAs and the. Uh, uh, the support uh, mechanisms as they're through the schools and everything else. But the real uh, part of this, I think, we're missing the point in relation to it. The point in relation to this is that children out there has missed at least seven months of school. A lot of that schooling has been done online. Great credibility to teach everybody involved. I think they've done a fantastic job. But where it weakens is when you have parents who's at home, whose education when they were going to school themselves is inadequate. And when they're trying to coax their children through online education. Now, the teachers do a fantastic job, but it's not a classroom environment. And the main gist that I want to get out from this motion is that the government recognise that there's thousands upon thousands of children out there that's not getting the full benefit of the education that they would if they were in the classroom. And the funding and the support needs to go into that. I know of a family where a young lassie lost, I think it was four months of her sixth class last year. She hasn't even done her confirmation so far. And yet she's this far now in the secondary and they're not going back until next month. And that family is actually strugg struggling and the child is struggling. A child that was an average child in school is actually struggling now because the parents can't provide the help. I know the teachers are there and the teachers are doing a fantastic job, but there's only so much that you can do. But I'm looking for a part B that the government steps in puts the resources into place to make sure that these children's education is brought up to the same standard as everybody else. This would not have happened only for the pandemic. 
An awful lot. Our lives are completely changed because of the pandemic. Everybody's saying when the pandemic is over, we get back to normal. Well, I want to make sure that when this pandemic is over, that these children get the same chance to be brought on as if they were in their school classroom. But the whole thing in relation to teachers, SNAs, school supports, everything, headmasters, the work that the teachers done themselves on the ground, I think it's fantastic. It's second to none. Nobody's questioning that. But what we do need to see, we do need intervention from the government, plan put into place to bring these children up. There's seven months of their education gone on a lot of these families. Not them all. The lucky ones are online. The family's there to support them, bring them on, and whatever else. If they were in a school classroom, the teacher's able to keep an eye on them. They're able to see their body language. They're able to monitor what's going on. These are the things that the teachers can miss on when and that the child actually fails on. But the one thing and I want to see is the government that needs to start putting into place a structure where they're able to work along with the family, the teacher and the child to bring the kids up to the standard. Thanks very much. Thanks, Councillor Gibbons. That's motion agreed. Um, item 46, votes of sympathy. I have some here up at the top. Table. I don't need proposed Councillor Milani, second Councillor Queenan. Uh, votes, congratulations. I have one here myself, I'll just read it out. Um, vote, congratulations be extended to Dara Keenan of Verdon at Last Ballymoat on securing a professional jockey licence after notching up 95 wins. This is um, a young lad from Ballymoat who left very young to go to England to take up um, j uh, jack and uh, take up um, horse jockey and as a, a profession. And in fairness to the young lad, he left at a very young age and he stuck at it. And I think he's a credit to his um, to his profession that after 95 wins, you know, he, he it's very hard on a young lad leaving this country, you know, maybe in their their 20s but this young lad left at i'd say 16 17 to go over and it was a big eye opener but he stuck at it and he's in, in fairness he's a, a great ambassador for the sport and i think for sligo so <laughs> that motion is agreed um great uh conferences training proposed councillor bray uh sorry um sorry apologies councillor clerk Wanted to get in there. Yes, Kier, look, I, I want to support your proposal to congratulate Dara on his great achievement. Uh, as you said yourself, you have it well covered, and I know his fa father and mother very well that, that they're in the pony club situation and uh, jump a few horses, and it's a great achievement for the young lad. And we wish him every success and to keep safe and to keep him providing enjoyment to us all. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Clerk. Um, item 49, to note the summary of proceedings, all conferences attended and accounted, noted. Uh, correspondence, all received. Agreed. Um, any matters arising from the minutes? No matters. Any other business? Uh, Councillor Healy. Um, I was wondering, is there any chance that we might get a meeting with TII in relation to the roads? Uh, I know that we had a meeting there not so long ago about bus stops and things like that, and that was a, a good informal meeting. I think it might be an opportunity for us to meet with TII and discuss a number of the roads and what projects might be coming up down the line and just get an insight at that councillors can put queries to them and questions to them regarding funding and other elements of of that. Thanks. All roads. All roads. All regional, national, or uh, every road. Yeah, we we'll just get a. Yeah. Uh, Councillor, we'll, we'll request that meeting with them. Councillor Gibbons. I was wondering, I didn't want to put down as a motion or anything else, and it's just something that came up there last week, and I said it'd be interesting to see. I wonder, is there any possibility that we may get an update on how the refurbishment is going up in Cranmore? of the properties up there you know that next week or the week after whenever i'm not putting any pressure on anybody but it actually do no harm maybe that we had a sit down and kind of get an update on what's happening in the area oh, yeah okay well we can request that uh, members um council gilroy yeah um so, sorry just uh, two two little issues one is um with the mention of roads there just to thank the roads department and uh Emer at the present and, and Thomas beforehand for the road up to the mountain 
bogs up at Luke's Bridge was completed today and to thank them for that I'm getting messages to say how excellent the job is now it's uh, hopefully a 30 or 40 year job so thanks for that and um, just I got a message there that the the, the thing about the Minister um, for Housing to Dara O'Brien it's to meet with the Director of Housing and the Chief Executive that he's come and it, it's not a party political thing we won't be meeting with him or anything like that so it's not, there's a COVID crisis on, so we're, we're following the rules. Okay, thanks. Councillor Gibbons. Uh, sorry, I'd like to retract that, what I actually asked about the Cranmore. It's just that my colleague here is out there reminding me that we're on the Cranmore regeneration. We have a meeting of that coming up, so we should be able to get an update report on that. So That's cheers. grand. Just, members, thanks for your cooperation. Now, we know the uh, April meeting is coming up, so look at... Uh, We'll be here for one day and we'll get it over and done with if everyone keeps it short and keeps it sweet. Um, you know, we're under time constraints, one hour 55. It's with the cooperation of everybody that we get the meeting covered in the one hour 55. I don't want to be asking people to not speak or cut people short, but I think, look, if we, if we I don't know what's, I know it was brought up at the at one time where we had the proposer and the seconder speak, or do you want to, you know, I don't want to curtail anybody, but it's bringing members in, some of the members here are travelling a long distance to come in for a second meeting in the month that maybe we could get covered. The motions are coming in, the replies are going out, so I think if there are issues with the replies, the media are being covered, the media are being circulated with the replies as well and the motion. So in fairness, I think, you know, everybody's getting coverage on what the issues they're bringing in. But if 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 you want to come in the second day, we'll come in the second day. But if you want to get it over in the one day, we'll get it over in the one day. But I think it, everybody needs to cooperate that we do that. So I leave it with yourselves and... As I say, hopefully we can get through it. And media covering the early meetings. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Then should we come in after that? Only these typical months. Come in after the dog basket. Things that are relevant. Put on the mic. Put on the mic. Yeah. And come in at so from now on, so the next couple of months. Come in at area issues that are, can be dealt with that are area meetings. Put them on the the area. If, if the media are covering all the issues. You know, it would make it would make it easier for you to hear it. We'll try and get out mm -hmm. in one hour fifty five because we are restricted yeah. to the one fifty five. We'll take right. it on one day. Okay, uh, I'll try to be quick. But all these were discussed at the procedures committee meeting. Yeah, we're going around in a circle every time we have a meeting. Yeah, we well, know the reasons behind it. I'm not arguing with look, you. Look, it should yeah, be, look at, yeah, no, it should be at the look, mem members. The region, uh, like the, my, the motion, should be kept for the municipal. Like the ordinary one should have bigger ones or stuff like that. You know, that's what we agreed yeah. at. It, well, you know? I think rather it's 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 at the discretion of members. We're all here long enough. We're all know what has to be done. We all know it's a one hour fifty five meeting. I don't want to have to every person that raises their hand or says they want to talk. I try and accommodate by letting them in. I think that's trying to be fair to everybody. But if a meeting goes on and we don't get it covered, it means we have to come back in. So, you know, it's it's up to the members to use their own, as I say, initiative to see that we get a meeting finished in one hour 55. Hopefully it's only temporary. We're a lot further on now than we were last March last year. And we're hoping that, you know, when the vaccine comes in, that we'll be able to go back, you know, but it just goes to show if we can get issues covered, the, the replies are going out, the media is covering them in fairness, they're giving us good coverage. And if there are motions that can be held from municipal meetings, I just ask for you to do that. And if we can keep the debate as short as we can, it allows us to get through the flow of the meeting quick. Cahir, I just wanted to say, Cahir, look, that you're doing an excellent job and I don't think anyone would be critical. And I think you do make a point. There are some councillors that tend to go on a little bit. Uh, but perhaps people might listen to you. Thank you. Councillor Clark. Uh, Cahir, look, I, I agree with you totally how you're approaching it. And, and, and as Councillor Brees says, uh, I have to admire the way you have uh, used your patience and skill to, to, to chair meetings. And as Councillor Bree has said, we have two issues. We have people bringing motions that can be dealt at the local meeting and people going on too long talking. And I'm wondering if for, for the next couple of months for local meetings, if councillors were allowed to have five motions at the local meetings, 
it still would get covered uh, rather than having three at the, at the general meeting. Uh, like the, uh, there's more time and more flexibility at the local meetings. And I, I like bringing in motions in relation to, to picnic tables in, in estates, like it's, it's crazy stuff. No, no, no. Look, yeah, we all we, look. We all know, and as I said, my I don't want to, you know, restrict some councils restrict members to two minutes, and I think I don't want to be going down that road. I think if everyone, it's people using their initiative okay, that we get through the meeting, and look. Uh, at the look, that's, the, that's that's the word. Look, you have to be praised for what you're doing. Use your initiative, and everyone. We could debate this here for another ten or fifteen minutes as well. If everybody uses their little bit of initiative, and and they all have the common sense, and that's the common sense approach, and that's 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 what will work, and that's what everyone should should do for the for the April meeting. Thanks. Okay, we left the last word to the wise man. <laughs> Okay, members, thanks for coming in. Agreed, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks.